following program on Ada Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. Good evening and welcome to yet another episode of Gen XYZ where we bring to you contemporary issues regarding the youth and what obstacles youth face and exactly how to overcome them. Now, being youth, we've always been in the digital age. There's never been an issue of where we have to incorporate ourselves. We've been born into the digital age, but we never really think to consider exactly what the safety aspects of the digital age really is. We know how to maneuver the internet, but we don't know how vulnerable we are on it. Now, to speak more on this topic, we have someone that could be considered to know everything about this field well not everything but uh, what there is to know considering exactly how exponentially this field is growing and that is Mr. Asela Vaidi Alankara. Hello. Hello very nice to meet you Asela. Come sit. Thank you. Thank you. How can I help you? Well, Asela, you are a cybersecurity consultant, so I'm going to assume you know the know-hows and exactly the ropes of how this cybersecurity issue goes and the ways of the internet. But a little bit, a little bit. But I mean, considering that you know a little bit more than the rest of us, I'd like you to enlighten us. Now, cybersecurity is a word that's been thrown around quite a bit. There's a lot of noise around this word. But honestly, as uh, someone from this generation, I don't exactly understand what cybersecurity means. Like, what what is cybersecurity? Could you walk us through that? That's an interesting question. And um, I do a lot of trainings. And the first thing we discuss is what do you mean by cybersecurity? Because it's been thrown around. You hear about it in the media all the time. But generally, when I talk to people, they don't have a very grasp of it, an in-depth understanding of what cybersecurity really means. So I'll start with the word cyber before we talk about the security, because I think everyone understands the word security. Cyber can be very broadly defined as anything that's connected to the internet. Now, I use the word anything, uh, not, a, not a PC, not a tablet, not a device, anything, because where we are heading, anything can be your toaster, your fridge, your car, anything can be connected to the internet. So the entire point is, when you talk about cyber security, the security of those things that are connected to the internet, security of those devices, as well as the information on it. Broadly, we can call that cybersecurity. I see. Well, now that we know a little bit about exactly like, you know, cybersecurity, it's security on the internet. And now we think security on the internet and we're like, wait, why? Like we have these encryption methods, we have passwords. Now, why? Why exactly are we vulnerable as youth on the internet? Could you just let us know exactly what causes us to be this vulnerable on the internet? I'll, I'll take a moment from something out of your intro. Uh, we call you guys the digital natives. We are all immigrants. Uh, when I grew up, there was not internet in this country. The internet, I believe, came to the Sri Lanka around the mid-90s. Uh, when I got the internet, you know, it was that dial-up modem and, you know, we had to wow. wait 20 minutes for the internet to connect. That sounds ancient. Uh, very much. Thank you. I feel very old. <laughs> <laughs> but the point being, uh, we call you guys the natives because you grew up with high-speed internet. Uh, the 3G, the 4G ages is when you grew up. So as the internet or the speed of the internet grew, your usage of the internet grows also. And because of that, you are most vulnerable because you use it the most. The footprint that you have within the internet, within your online activities is much more than, for example, someone like me who are older. Because of that, and because of the fact that your exposure is so high, we need to really talk to you about the security, the, the vulnerabilities, how you can be safe online, etc. 
I see. Well, I mean, considering that you mentioned that our digital footprint is much larger compared to uh, those of our generations prior, uh, not to consider you ancient, but then there is a little bit of a, there's a significant difference actually when considering how we have integrated with the internet and exactly, you know, how we navigate the internet is completely different to the perspective of someone from another generation as well. Absolutely. Now, we mentioned that, you know, there is a lot of things that can be done according to you know cybersec there are lots of uh, initiatives there are lots of drives that help to promote better cybersecurity in the country but what can we do as an individual how can we protect ourselves and how can we contribute towards protecting a social media site or exactly like a platform how do we individually contribute towards cybersecurity you know before covid there was a for me to explain some of these concepts was a little difficult but post covid era uh, we have concepts called cyber hygiene. So basically how you keep your self hygiene or uh, away from dangers online. And we use some of the concepts that uh, we learnt in COVID era as well. So what we learnt in COVID era, wash your hands, social distancing, wear a mask. In the internet or in the cyber world, we have certain cyber hygiene practices as well. Primary to that is to have good password hygiene. Now, password hygiene is having a proper password, having a password that's not easily guessable. Generally, we don't recommend to have passwords that are your birthdays, uh, your names, your pets' names even, because these are things that can be picked up from your social media feeds. Uh, you're a cat lover, I'm a dog lover. Uh, there's no point using our dog or cat's name because those animals are plastered all over our socials. Terrible. So uh, anyone looking, doing a reconnaissance of our social media, can immediately guess our passwords, our birthdays are there. I've seen people put their birthdays on their social media. I wish me on. So yep. certainly, you know, that sort of password hygiene is required. Secondly, we have keeping devices up to date. I know it's a chore and most people, most youngsters that I speak to, they don't do it. It's like, oh my God, it's such a chore. But the point is, if you don't, you are exposing yourself to more vulnerabilities. Because what pass, uh, especially these updates, software updates do is to make sure that your device is up to date in terms of security. Because if they found holes, what the manufacturers and what the basically the, the designers and the people who code do is, they make sure they patch those vulnerabilities. And with the security updates, with the software updates, you get the latest version of that. That's number two. Thirdly, we always recommend backing up, having a proper backup policy. Uh, that could be in the cloud, that could be on a portable hard disk or a thumb drive, doesn't matter. Have a proper backup policy. Uh, generally what I teach sometimes is the 3 two, one policy. So three places, two cloud backup, one cold backup, which is a thumb drive or a uh, portable hard disk. So you have, you have your patches, you have your uh, software updates, you have your password policies um, and you have your backups. In, the, in One more thing you can do is a lot of these social media sites have privacy controls. A uh, lot of the time we see, because I consult uh, for law enforcement as well on some of these matters, and most of the time the trouble starts when your settings are left exposed and public, and some of the information, some of your photographs, all of that can be taken. So that's another measure you can take. So collectively those measures, these cyber hygiene practices can keep you safe online, uh, better than most. So if you follow these steps, and there's a little bit more, but I'll, I won't bore you with all the details, but these cyber hygiene practices help us to be one step ahead in terms of the risks that are there online. All right, so there is quite a little bit of uh, etiquette or hygiene that we have to you know, go through in order to maintain, bolster security and mm. keep it an airtight ship. Now, I'm pretty sure a lot of us watching will you know, think, oh my gosh, like it's one password, like seven different platforms. <laughs> um, I'm, I think you, I'm a little You know, bit you busy. raise an interesting point. Actually, sometime back, uh, I believe SL Cert had done a study and they found that one in four, that's 25% of Sri Lankan youth, never change their password. And again, uh, uh, about half of them use the same password for so many different websites. So these are two dangers. I mean, I, I'll come to that. 
But these are dangers that we see, especially if you keep reusing your password. And I'll come to that. Yeah, of course. Like we can we can speak about that in detail, actually. But now that you mentioned, you know, social media sites and their security updates and patches and things like that, I just wanted to poke a little bit. We can discuss this further in depth as well. But VPNs, they've become very popular because of a certain issue in mm. Sri Lanka. VPNs have become commonplace now. You know, even people that refuse to use it, considering they were like malware or something like that, they also download it from the internet if it's free they go to specific countries and they connect and uh, that allowed us to reach our voice as well uh, certain times of uh, the social uh, circumstances that we had a few months back as well could you just walk us through now vpns what exactly how are we vulnerable if we use vpns and like is there a way to mitigate risks that can come with these things vpn usage in sri lanka was because of circumstances the social unrest and the circumstances that happened uh, because we, unfortunately, for this country, we've had a lot of digital curfews, uh, if you can call them that. And because of that, people are very savvy now. Uh, sort of default setting now is to revert to a VPN. Uh, but the only issue is, I've discussed this uh, a bit as well, certainly people download haphazardly VPNs. Now, there are established VPNs out there, but even then, sometimes they have very uh, sketchy history of sharing user data, usage data. Even, you know, we have the, we operate on the illusion that uh, VPNs will assure anonymous browsing and continuous browsing. But what happens most of the times is these companies are companies for profit. So they have to make money and how they make money is to sell that data to third party data brokers or some other, even governments at times because, you know, that's how they make the money. So when I advise on VPNs, not that I'm for or against it, but certainly buyer beware. Why when you're using it, be cautious of when you use it and how you use it because of the inherent risks some of these pose. One of it was there are fake apps out there that pretend to be VPNs because you just search for VPNs and you don't have, you don't think much about it. You download said app it probably does a VPN function, but in the meantime, it might be taking your data or doing some malicious activity on your device, which you don't want. So this is why I said stick to known brands. Secondly, there are paid and free alternatives. You can go for a paid one even, because at least you're assured of, you know, you are putting money down. And these, like I said, these companies have to make money. If it's a free version, again, be a little cautious because you may be the product if it's free. Yep. So... Those are few things you need to be cautious of. Generally, again, something people don't discuss is when you have a VPN, your data usage generally spikes. We have a 15 to 20% spike in your data because the way VPNs are designed, because it has to go through certain servers, uh, and because your traffic is rerouted, the whole, the plumbing of that makes sure that you, your data bill gets a little higher as well. So this is something, again, you have to be cautious of because I know everybody's watching their bills as well. Uh, these are some of the risks that are out there, but certainly in certain situations, especially what we've been through, it is useful provided it is used the correct way. I see. And VPNs are double-edged sword, Absolutely. according to what you mentioned as well. Now, VPNs and social media usage during social unrest in Sri Lanka was something that was very popular, that was yeah. done by everyone. And through this, actually, this is a good segue, I'd like to speak a little bit about a very controversial topic considering Anonymous now. Mm. Social media was responsible in the call towards Anonymous, you know, saying Anonymous helped Sri Lanka, Anonymous saved Sri Lanka. It's a very controversial topic because, again, we don't know. An anonymous is Anonymous. And we, we really had no idea, but we still invited them. And, uh, you know, as youth, I feel like had a really big part to play in it. Could you just, just tell us, uh, tell our audience exactly what repercussions come out of inviting such a, a malicious or unknown hacker group that stands for social justice into Sri Lanka and how it compromises our cybersecurity personally and on a whole as a nation? That's an excellent point you made. So we were horrified when this entire call thing, I... We generally first dismissed it, thinking that it was maybe done in humor or jest. But when we saw the organic hashtag grow, uh, our concern as a community, cybersecurity community, also grew. Uh, because you must understand who Anonymous is. And I partially blame this on not having awareness. Because you just read headlines 
and you misunderstood who Anonymous was. Anonymous is what we call a hacker collective. Uh, the way Anonymous is designed is it's bits and pieces of different individuals coming together for a common cause. Uh, common cause or common, you know, basically social justice, uh, you know. It's a collective. Collective. Yeah. So when we said hashtag op Sri Lanka or hashtag anonymous come, Sri, come save Sri Lanka and anonymous responded to that with what we call hashtag op Sri Lanka, you basically had a distributed set of hackers exposing our government or digital assets. And we don't know what their impulsions are. You know, some may be doing it for the sake of it. Some may be having malicious intentions because we saw certain government websites being compromised. We saw certain government data, especially the SLBFE, you know, physical addresses, phone numbers, email addresses of people exposed online. Almost like doxing. Exactly. And we don't know, we still don't understand, probably we never realize the true impact of calling this hacker collective in. Because, yeah, there might be people who are doing it, let's say, just for the disruption's sake. But piggybacking on those guys might be individuals that have malicious sinter. Because don't forget, cyber criminals are also part of Anonymous. They use Anonymous as a backdoor into some of uh, these government assets and digital assets that we have. Listen, we are incredibly weak anyway in terms of our e-government systems at times. To invite a hacker collective of the nature of Anonymous. Asking for trouble. <laughs> absolutely. And, and to, to completely disrupt our systems, leak our information, we don't know the impact we cause. Honestly, we are still assessing it. My personal opinion is it will take at least two years for us to realize even how much of a damage we cause because that information is out there. That can be used by someone else to launch another attack, to expose you, to steal your data. So the true cascading impact of that we are yet to be assessed. And we really, really need to, I mean, I, I, I welcome that you're questioning it and welcome that you're taking the effort to inform your audience about it because awareness is essential because I don't want another repeat of this. Uh, we are, we are bad in, in bad shape anyway. I don't want hacker collectives coming in and disrupting the very little progress that we've made so far. Yeah, as well. there's like exactly like you know it's building, breaking down whatever we've attempted to build up as a country and cybersecurity individually as well was compromised due to this. We can actually speak a little bit more about exactly where our country stands right after this break. Let's go in for a short commercial break. You're watching Gen X Y Z. Stay with us. Back to Gen XYZ, we were in conversation with Asela Waidi Alankara, who is a consultant of cyber tech now, and cyber security. Now, we were talking exactly about how youth can be vulnerable in the current digital age and what the atmosphere is like right now, you know, with the introduction of Anonymous and VPNs, how they work. Now, we before we dropped off into the break, we were talking about exactly how our country might have been compromised through recent actions in the digital sphere. Now, could we please dwell deeper into that exactly? Now, how would do, how does Sri Lanka as a country compare to the rest of the world when it comes to cybersec? So the best benchmark right now what we have is the cybersecurity index. We are ranked number 98. Uh, I know that doesn't mean anything right now, just taking that figure. But what we can do is we can look at our regional peers. Generally, we have always been behind India. India ranks very high, around the top 10 in terms of cybersecurity. Generally, in the region, Sri Lanka was number two. But of late, we have noticed countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, Maldives, even Nepal in some aspects, really coming forward and sometimes leaping over us in terms of the cybersecurity ranking. So right now within the region, I must say, we are like number three or number four in the region, which is not great. Uh, generally, this ranking is being taken considering three aspects, people, process and technology. People, meaning what is the capacity of the people, the technical capacity, their know-how, do we have enough people for that particular roles in cybersecurity, etc. The process, I would say, is the policies, the laws, the standards, 
etc. We know, for example, Sri Lanka earlier this year passed the Personal Data Protection Act, which is very much needed. It was three years, four years in the works, and finally we got that out. There is a cybersecurity bill currently being discussed. We had two cabinet uh, meetings on it. However, it's still with the legal draftsman. So what we would like to see is that coming out and being presented to parliament and that also being active. So that's probably something we can work towards. Thirdly, we have central bank itself coming up with regulations for banks in terms of ISO 27000 and all these security standards that banks have to follow when they're working with, for example, Visa or Master the International Credit Cards, as well as amongst themselves or international banks, there are certain standards that mandate that they have to be. So in that term, we are looking at it and it is maturing, but when you look at globally where people are at, certainly we need to go further. So I spoke about, spoke about people, I spoke about process, and then we go to the technology part. Now, generally as a country to be safe, what we call a SOC is necessary, SOC, Security Operations Center. Right now, there's one wing of the military that has a very small scale SOC, but certainly as a country, we require a SOC, uh, that technological advancement. This has again been in the works since about 2016, 2017. Unfortunately, for various reasons now with the economic crisis, that plan is on hold. So that also needs to come to bear, fru bear fruit for us to have a holistic defense of people, process and technology. So I've just given you a flavor of where we are at at the moment, because if you look at the other countries, even our neighborhood, you know, they're far more advanced in terms of their technological uh, overlook, their capacity building, as well as the, some of the laws and the processes they follow. So this is what we really need to ramp up. And this needs attention right at the top. Generally, what we see is countries that have very successful cybersecurity practices. The cybersecurity office or the agency is reporting directly to the head of state. Then only you understand the importance of it and that elevation comes for cybersecurity in that country. So I hopefully that's something uh, that can occur because right now I think uh, cybersecurity cert is under the technology ministry, which is under the president at the moment. So hopefully. Uh, that would give some much needed uh, policy imputers to make sure that this, this issue is not a technological issue, but a national issue and discussed in national uh, audience. And that's what we require. Exactly. And so by extension, we do have some, uh, like, well, not a complete SOC, but then we do have some sort of defense. We ha we're getting somewhere, but we're not quite there yet. I think that's a fair assessment. Exactly. Yes. And also now considering like, even with our neighbors, you know, China, India, the Maldives even, we can speak about exactly how uptight their personal data and national data, you know, cybersec protection is. Uh, now, even on an international scale, now apps like, you know, Instagram and Snapchat, you know, social media in general, we, we're connected with the rest of the world. We're connected with much more secure nations individually, mm. you know, across the globe. It's a very amazing phenomenon that we still, you know, are developing. But now there's a rumor going around. It's not just, you know, recent, but we have always thought, you know, oh, my God, we need to protect our data. Our data has been stolen by these apps, you know, mm. Snapchat, IG, sensitive data leaks. Maybe I should use a VPN. Maybe I should use a different browser. Now, could you please just tell us about exactly, like, what is the truth behind us? Is social media siphoning our data? Siphoning is, a, is an interesting term because that would indicate it is being done without consent. Unfortunately, what the situation now is, you have consented to give your data exactly, away. Exactly, yeah. Uh, because when you click I agree and when you're using most of these, these uh, platforms, you understand you use it free. That has a price. You are the price. You are the product, as we say. Because it's your data that's been dissected, your location data, your usages, your likes, your dislikes. You know, some years ago, I'll give you a good example. Facebook had, and this was some time back, it's probably more now. Facebook had 6,600 data points on you. What do you mean by data point? Age, sex, location, type of device, the OS, the devices. 6,600. And when you delve deep into that, that is, for example, likely to join a gym or not, likely to eat in or out, uh, likely to be conservative or liberal in your political views, uh, likely to be compliant or non-compliant in terms of society. So all of those were factors taken as variables and you were classified on that. 
and that is the gamut of data that these companies are sitting on. Because if you take any social media platform right now, uh, be it Meta, be it uh, TikTok, be it uh, any, any social media platform, 90% plus the revenue comes from advertising. And then the question you must ask yourself is, what are they advertising? And it's, it's not pet products, it's not uh, you know, energy drinks. You are the product that they're advertising. You are the product that they're selling. So I would, take, uh, I would beg to differ on the term siphoning, because you have already written away your rights. In the future, there'll be only people who have protected their data and not protected their data. Because data will be such a premium asset that the, the probably the wealth classifying also will be of how much data is protected with you and how much data you have given away. So I, I foresee it will come to that situation. But certainly, I mean, data leaks aside, data leaks is just these, these organizations have this bunch of data and they've stored it in a way that's not secure and somebody else has gained access to it. Beyond that, what you have to worry about is how much of data that you're giving away on a daily basis. And what I really encourage anyone, uh, go to Google, type the internet in a minute, and you get a nice little Ferris wheel of what happens in one minute of the internet. Staggering amount of Snapchats, of, of Instagram uploads, of videos being uploaded on YouTube, so many things of, of WhatsApp chats. This is the footprint of data that we're giving out in one minute. Think of yourself. Take a moment, look at your phone. You spend six, seven, eight, sometimes upwards of 10 hours on your device. That's all data that you're giving out and somebody's getting that data, classifying the data and constructing data models based on your behavior. So you're the product. And, and, and then people fighting for your data. And Probably that may be people be like, yeah, so I have nothing to hide. Why, you know, people can get data out of me. The danger is not that. The danger is what they do with that data. And we saw, we saw what Brexit did. We saw what the 2016 election did. You would, can be manipulated in mass to back certain ideal, ideologies, certain policies, certain candidates, and Destinies of nations can be changed because of that. And the best example I take is Brexit, because the same Cambridge Analytica that was behind the 2016 uh, presidential election in the US was the same company that was behind Brexit. And you saw what Brexit did to the United Kingdom right now. It lost its title of the world's most... They're uh, reeling from the impact. Yes. And we saw the economic impact of it. That is what it can do, and that is because somebody's data was stolen and that data was manipulated. So you can see how much tectonic shifts that can occur just when people use or misuse data. Wow, that is actually, I mean, it feels like an almost dystopian concept where, you know, your data is either protected or it's not, and it feels like data is a weapon, like even your own data could be weaponized against you. And that's exactly how uh, the 2016 election and Brexit actually happened. It changed the course of nations. And it's uh, when you think about it in retrospect, there was a way to have prevented this. There was, you know, hygiene practices that could have been in place there. There was a way to overcome such issues, uh, you know, manipulation, especially considering how absorbent we are as a generation as well. Now, Exactly considering that, Twitter, now Twitter, <laughs> yes, yeah, it is cause for concern. It's uh, frankly humiliating at some points because of exactly what has been done, what the management has done uh, to mitigate the circumstances of certain events that occurred. Now, over, you know, since being taken over by Elon Musk, there has been uh, issues, uh, to say the least, in Twitter. Now, could you just tell us, like, you know, tell our audience just casually exactly how the repercussions are with the whole blue check issue, like authenticity on the internet was challenged by just a single man who put forward this policy. Like one man's decision was capable of creating so much chaos. You know, verified information was so hard to get. Could you just tell us how much of a repercussion that has for youth? Especially youth, um, I'll just look at, obviously it's been about two weeks since uh, Elon took over. $44 billion, uh, when you look at the impact, Sri Lanka's entire debt portfolio is about 20 or $30 billion, as sort of puts that figure into, into perspective. Pers um, but you see, 
the the strength of twitter is not in its numbers the strength of twitter is the significant influence it holds over other social media platforms as well because you see world leaders celebrities influencers of any industry are on twitter and a lot of information disseminates up and down on twitter a lot of official announcements we seen even in this country uh, best example is the minister the minister of power and energy most of his announcements now don't come to the media they come on twitter, twitter yeah. and in fact the media picks it up that's a, that's an excellent example of twitter diplomacy uh, but the point is because of twitter what twitter is unfortunately it holds a lot of sway in the information uh, ecosystem because so many journalists so many verified information flows from twitter when you mess with something like that and i understand probably the reasoning elon had because twitter as a company has not been profitable and certainly when you invest uh, 44 billion dollars which is the largest tech acquisition to date uh, you really need to have an roi and you really need to turn things around so this 8 dollar for the verification came in but the point that was lost is a lot of people relied on verified accounts to provide that information and the best example is i think there was one company a pharmaceutical company there was a parody account that came uh they said we are giving away insulin for free they lost i think 400 million dollars or something uh, wiped off their uh, stock, stock exchange value yeah. because of that particular announcement and that is a excellent example of don't mess with something that don't fix something that isn't broken uh, the the blue check mark however you know contentious it was be it had a certain standing within the community and globally as well when you are blue check mark when you are verified that information or that person is considered authentic to provide that information and unfortunately that ecosystem has now been disrupted uh we know now of course there is a secondary uh, ash color check mark that's going as official we don't know and elon has said by the end of the month uh, they are going to fix this issue because i part of me understands because you're running running a company you need to make it profitable twitter has not been profitable whereas you look at the other social media platforms they've been extreme extraordinary profitable so certainly and and twitter being twitter the pope is on twitter uh, so many world leaders are on twitter it's such a multiply effect that twitter has and unfortunately it has not been able to monetize that uh, i don't know whether elon's disruption will will break twitter or you know turn it into something profitable it is yet to be seen it's only 2 weeks since it took over but certainly the the information and the verified issue has shaken the confidence of a lot of people we see brands pulling out uh, i see a lot of uh, cybersec people also pulling out and they're going to mastodon and uh, other platforms looking for other platforms at least so it's going to be an interesting few months to see what he does uh, and and more importantly he has laid off a lot of employees because again he's trying to look at the Major balancing layoffs. the books like meta uh, like meta but the problem is meta at least you know they took a trajectory and and they're trying to scale back on it the problem is now elon fired or or because of his actions the ciso the chief security information officer the chief data protection officer the policy staff the entire european policy staff left the indian policy staff all are gone content moderation guys all of those people have been laid off and you can you imagine the amount of vacuum that you have created now where the policy people are gone the content moderation people are gone uh, and the people entrusted to safeguard the data your data my data on that platform is gone now and and then you have the us government saying listen we want to come in and and look at this whole thing how you mishandling the whole thing Uh, today in fact i read that the two factor authentication is not working because he's messing around with the code now so you you have real implications of people's information people's data being threatened by his actions so he, honestly somebody has to get together and try to put this in line maybe talk sense with elon and try to see if they can fix this but long way to go uh 
like I said, it will make Twitter or it will break Twitter. The it's a Twitter it. metamorphosis, actually. Absolutely. Like we, we have absolutely. no idea what's going to come next. Poor bird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that poor bird. Uh, well, before we get into a little bit more about exactly social media platforms and, you know, the varying amounts of social media platforms and what they ensue, uh, we'll take a very short break. You're watching Gen XYZ. Stay with us. Welcome back to Gen XYZ. We're in our final segment now with some of the most pressing questions. Now, we spoke about Twitter and mm. Elon and exactly, you know, the whole mess that happened there. Um, yeah, thank you. So, we have Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat, but honestly, now, platforms such as Truth Social, Trump's social media platform, mm. it's, uh, you know, potentially supposed to be one of the most uh, influential sites because of the amount of political, uh, you know, <laughs> supporters that end up uh, joining simply because of the affiliation. Now, when it comes to social media platforms and other platforms in general, why not Sri Lanka? Like, why can't Sri Lanka have our own? And if there is a possibility of that, what are the cybersec issues that are related with, like, you know, starting up a social media platform and how that could affect our data and the nation's data? Because it's almost like putting all our data into one portfolio and almost like presenting it to malicious, uh, you know, areas. It's a... Uh, it's a social media platform. So could you just uh, let us know about that? Uh, that's an interesting proposition. Uh, it's not that it hasn't been done before or tried to be done before. The problem probably creating our own social media platform is scale. Because we have an internet population of about 6 million people. Uh, so let's say even if you get three I don't know whether that's going to be profitable given the investment that is required. Uh, part of the reason why social media is successful is scale. You have, for example, Facebook has upwards of a billion people. Uh, TikTok's numbers are growing. Instagram has phenomenal numbers. Numbers uh, and revenue per user is the metric that you determine success of a social media platform. So when you take a, a, well, a population like Sri Lanka, despite our digital literacy now being around 50%, still we're looking at about 6 million people. So of that, you know, somebody new comes along, how many people would go on that particular platform is, con is, is a matter of contention. Secondly, uh, attractiveness. You're currently on, let's say, Snapchat, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook. Why would you go on a so another social media platform? What would be the... USP, the unique selling point of something like that, apart from being just Sri Lankan. The second part of your question, you said it's scary that, you know, if somebody were to amass all this data about us, I would beg to differ. For example, telco companies already have an obscene amount of data on individuals. They know where you work, they know where you, your home is. They have a general idea of your movement patterns. Uh, and this is something they actually actively use for their digital marketing. But the point being is, we call this concept data sovereignty, where the citizen's data should probably be within the borders of that own country. The Personal Data Protection Act itself, I believe it was section 26, uh, says that any public data, that is all government data, should always be within the geolocation of Sri Lanka. So that means Sri Lankan data centers, Sri Lankan local servers, and it can't be sent out. Uh, Unfortunately, how the internet wiring is wired or how the internet plumbing works, it's a little difficult to geofence data into a certain location for private sector. Now, for example, even e-commerce platforms. If you use, let's say, the Amazon cloud, sometimes those cloud servers are located in Singapore. Uh, so it's physically sometimes impossible for them to maybe migrate that data into a local data center sometimes because how they're built. So it not inherently has its challenges, but certainly to answer your question, banks and telcos have an obscene amount of data on you. Secondly, there is a concept called digital sovereignty, uh, which is now enshrined in the, the data, Personal Data Protection Act. Uh, and thirdly, in terms of security, uh, so that act also talks about the security aspects, certain measures you have to take, 
uh, chief uh, data protection officer has to be uh, you know basically appointed now once the cybersec act comes in there's a CISO or Chief Information Security Officer needs to be appointed. The banks, the central bank has mandated now, all banks should have what we call a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer. So there are controls that are coming to in place, but certainly higher degree of controls given the, the higher quality of information that we are extracting from people, especially these two sectors. Yeah, well, I mean, it's almost like a why not, but then there's the ROI to consider as well, and it's almost, well, it's about too late to actually worry about how uh, data is being amassed, mm. and it's already being done, and yeah, we're being uh, constantly under surveillance almost, uh, but it can't be helped. I mean, we have to now make do with what we've got, and we've got to take precautions, starting now itself, even if it makes little to no impact. It's better to start now than to never start at all. Absolutely. And Absolutely. that's where I'd like to actually, you know, circle us off and just get to the first segment where you said we will uh, speak a little bit more about password encryption and, you know, using the same type of passwords. It's almost like wearing the same pair of underwear seven days of the week. <laughs> it genuinely feels like that. But a lot of us are guilty of doing it because of the convenience, you know, mm. like autofill from Google has our information, like we just click log in and it just logs right in. Okay. Instagram already has like, you know, like you don't have to type in your data anymore, <laughs> just click the button and you'll just go right in, just save it onto this server. It's a very suspicious but very convenient. So could you just let us know about what we as youth can do to take precautions against, you know, getting our uh, data compromised and how to better protect and of course, data hygiene and, you know, the etiquette that ensues. Part of the biggest problem I see in terms of youth is password sharing. Uh, and this is not only a technical problem now, it's become a social problem. Because one thing I've observed is, for example, when young people get into a relationship, one thing I've noticed is... I'll give uh, you my Instagram. Yes, here's my password. And because that's, that's taken as a currency of trust, giving your password. But unfortunately, from, a, from where I'm standing, from information security point of view, that's very risky because somebody knows your password. Uh, basically, somebody, you are not, not you, has access to your information. And we have seen time and time again so many instances where that type of behavior has had very negative repercussions, especially on girls. Uh, sharing their password and certainly when, when a particular relationship breaks off, sometimes their data is exposed, their, their photographs, their personal photographs are taken and manipulated and so on and so forth. So this is perhaps if I can identify one behavior that I can, uh, you know, appeal to all of you all is stop sharing your passwords. Secondly, like you said, it's very difficult because right now everyone wants passwords. So probably what you can do is use what we call a password manager. Now there are paid options, there are free options. I would recommend you do your research and go for a paid option simply because you're showing you're serious about your security and as you go along and as you mature, uh, you know, a password manager becomes critical because A, it, it creates, it does, it solves the problem for you. It creates all these long, very complex passwords that's very difficult to breach. And you don't have to have the hassle of remembering all these passwords because it does it for you and you have to remember only one. Uh, so it solves both of your problems and you don't have to share your password because you say, listen, I don't know what my password is because its password is auto-generated. Three of your problems. Uh, but generally, honestly, I do recommend this sort of password hygiene because it's something that is creating a social impact. Uh, some of the social issues I mentioned as well. We as a country don't have a culture of privacy. If you, if you have a mother that opens your mail, uh, the snail mail that comes to your house, you know that we as a country lack privacy and it's not inculcated in our culture. But the downside is, as we get into a digital space, we need to have this conversation on privacy. And see, cyber hygiene, part of the digital etiquette and all of that, I honestly feel and I do make an effort into this because I do go to schools, uh, I go to rural areas and I do have that conversation, especially with kids, about creating awareness of some of these things. Because what we've done is essentially, we've given the keys to the car, but the guy doesn't know how to drive. He doesn't know what the road signs means. He doesn't know what to do. We've given the keys to the car, a very powerful car, being the internet and online. And you can do anything on it. But no one's taught you the rules of the game. And that's dangerous. 
and that is something we need to address as a country. But certainly in my capacity, I have, we are trying as much to keep the awareness going. Two groups, one is youth and one is the elders, because the elders are also now on the internet and they have no idea. Horrible. This is a completely alien uh, environment for them. No one's there to teach them. At least you guys are natives. You know how to operate the platforms. Uh, we have elderly people with their bank accounts, doing their shopping, doing their, buying their medicine online. And that is a risk. And that is something we need to address as a country as well. Definitely. It's the need of the hour right now. And uh, well, you're right. It's a very, very impressive car. We've been given the keys, but we have no idea how exactly to navigate the roads and how to go about it. Now that we were talking about privacy and you know how privacy is not uh, cultivated within Sri Lanka's atmosphere because it's a cultural and traditional issue. It has been like this for generations. And I feel like it might continue for a few more years before actual change is made. Now on that point, I'd like to mention now there was social unrest in Sri Lanka and youth were at the forefront of you know leading the charge and you know demanding change especially in the digital atmosphere now there are concerns with cyber sec increasing in Sri Lanka now there's there was a little bit of mistrust with the government as well so there is this issue like with cyber sec improving in the future will there be any sort of infringement upon the freedom of expression in Sri Lanka because that's a very contentious topic like will that affect our freedom of expression with cyber sec being increased Excellent question. Uh, we saw in terms of the Aragale, most of the voices were amplified on social media. Uh, and we saw how the space was created in an organic way uh, in terms of you know, expression to come, up, come forth and to make actually some lasting changes because of that. Cyber security is a double-edged sword. There's a sword, there's a shield. There are situations, I won't deny it, where governments have used cyber security and imposition of cyber security controls as a backdoor to suppress dissent. What we need to emphasize, and this is something we as policy uh, experts also ex uh, try to emphasize on, cyber security must be for the protection of the citizens and their data. It should not be to suppress dissent. So there must be adequate checks and balances in any piece of legislation or any measures that you're taking that would ensure that you are not infringing on your freedom of expression, which is our constitutional right. So whatever we discuss in space of cyber security, in keeping your devices secure, your data secure, uh, policy measures we can take in terms of acts, all of that should be under the fundamental rights and that should be, never be negotiable at any, any point. And one thing we advocate is independent oversight. Certainly when it comes to, you know, we have a data protection agency that's going to come. Majority of that is going to be appointed by the minister. Again, you have state control over that. Do we need some sort of independent oversight? Absolutely. The CyberSec Act will have a cyber security agency which has a lot of oversight uh, in terms of the digital space in this country when it does come. Again, do we need independent oversight on that? Absolutely. So perhaps can these things be under maybe the Constitutional Council or something like that, where it has an independent civil society, activists, political leaders, complete checks and balances and oversight is required. Because this is not to protect a state cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is to protect the individual and a country's data and information. And that is the key aspect here. And that is non-negotiable. Uh, that is not going, that it shouldn't infringe on anyone's personal rights. And I think that's an important conversation we need to have. Very important conversation indeed. There's actually a lot more to you know delve deep into, considering how vast the internet itself really is. There's a lot more to discuss, but unfortunately, our time with you here ends right now. Thank you very much for joining us, Asil. It was such an insightful discussion. Pleasure is all mine, and thank you for having me, and thank you for having this conversation. Thank you very part. much for the insightful uh, education that you have just uh, granted us. Well, that's all we have for you today on Gen X Y Z. If you miss this program you can catch us on our YouTube channel youtube.com slash other than English we'll join you again next week with yet another discussion that is contentious towards the youth this is Gen XYZ thank you for watching good night